Thank you, guys. I'm very flattered to be in the formal methods section. I think it makes it look like we know what we're doing. Uh, so hopefully, by the end of the talk, uh, we'll be able to confirm this. So uh, I'll be presenting our work on detecting flaws in iOS sandbox profiles. So uh, to get us started, I'm going to show you a few examples of flawed uh, policies for access control by pointing out some American laws that I find entertaining. The first one is from Texas. So you can't buy beer on midnight after Sunday but any time on Monday is fine. So this is obviously contradictory. Uh, you don't really know which one is relevant at the time. Uh, the next interesting law is from my home state of Louisiana. You can't tie your alligator to a fire hydrant. So they felt the need to make this very clear. But I can tie my alligator to something else if I want, so it's a very specific law. <clears throat> uh, and then another bad policy, unfortunately, is from iOS version 9. Uh, we found that third-party apps can read your map search history. They can bypass certain privacy settings, and they can consume the storage on your device in a very hard to undo way. So uh, I'm going to show you guys an illustration of the iOS architecture. I know this is a huge amount of information to take in, but I'm going to point out a few layers that we care about. At the top, you see the application layer. Uh, this includes third-party applications, system applications. A lot of iOS work has been done on this area. So they'll find specific vulnerabilities in specific apps uh, that affect a subset of the applications on the market. Uh, aside from, uh, other than this, we are working on the bottom layer, the core OS layer. In here, I'll be talking about privacy settings, the sandbox, et cetera. Uh, this involves the kernel and a lot of the supporting code at a very low level. Now, vulnerabilities at this level can affect any device running on iOS. Uh, we also found out that many of them are also relevant to watch OS and TV OS, and they'll affect any applications running on those devices. So the impact can sometimes be much larger. <clears throat> so what is iOS sandboxing? The sandbox's job in iOS is to regulate system calls. Uh, it's going to consider whether or not you should be able to read a certain file or write a file or make a network connection. These are all system call access control. The sandbox policy is created by a developer who writes a sandbox profile. That's sort of the code they write to decide what the policy should be. Um, <clears throat> And then all third-party applications use the same profile called the container sandbox profile. We also found that some system applications use this profile, too. So the question becomes, why do we even need sandboxing? Apple has an app review process. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a lot of demonstrations lately, uh, such as Jekyll on iOS or maybe other techniques, that allow an application to behave very nicely during the review process and then suddenly become malicious when it's on a user's device. So it's hard to predict everything an application can do. We want to restrict as much as we can the damage they can do if they go crazy once they're on a device. So uh, related to the container profile, our research question is, what flaws in the container sandbox profile can third-party iOS applications exploit? This is a hard question to answer for three reasons. The first one is that sandbox profiles are not human readable in their current form. They are compiled into a proprietary format and stored in the kernel. So it's a lot of work to reverse engineer them to a point where a human can read them and decide whether the, law, uh, the rules are reasonable or not. The second problem is that these profiles are very complicated. Even if you get it into a human readable for, uh, form, there could be thousands of lines of nested parentheses. And I'll show you an example of, of some sandbox profiles, and you'll see what I mean. Finally, if we do find a flaw in the sandbox, we have to demonstrate that it can actually be exploited. So we'd have the vulnerability, but then how do we really get people's attention and show them that it's an issue that can put users in danger? Uh, this is an overview of our solution to these challenges. In the first step, we decompile the sandboxes. So we get these from iOS firmware, which is publicly available online. You can download any version that you want, and then you can extract the compiled profiles from the kernel. <clears throat> Once you have these compiled profiles, you still can't read them. It's just a bunch of binary. Uh, so we run them through the tool we created called Sand, uh, Sandblaster that will get you a human readable version that you can start to work with. But it's still really complicated. So we want to model it in a more computer friendly way. We can take those profiles and we made a SPPL, Sandbox Profile Language, compiler uh, that will take that and turn it into prolog facts. Prolog is much more amenable to being queried and, and being analyzed for certain properties. Uh, we take those prolog facts and we run queries based on what we're looking for, our security requirements, and then that'll tell us very suspicious file paths that violate our security requirements. We run those file paths through an attack testing application, and out comes uh, the attacks that succeed, and those can be forwarded to Apple. Here's more detail on the first challenge. So 
each version of iOS can potentially have about 100 uh, compiled profiles. Like I said, the one we, compare, we care most about is the container profile. There are lots of others, but today I'm focusing on container. These profiles are stored as directed acyclic graphs. <clears throat> and we can convert those graphs into sandbox profile language uh, through Sandblaster. So Sandblaster has a lot of other steps, but during this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on the graphs. That's because some of the other steps have been addressed by similar work by Stefan Esser. Uh, and if you are interested in those steps, you can focus on our uh, tech report, which we have re uh, published recently, called Sandblaster Reversing the Apple Sandbox. So uh, I mentioned these direct directed acyclic graphs. I'm going to show you an example of a system call being evaluated in the graph. They're set up to be evaluated very efficiently in this way. Um, in this case, each node of the graph represents uh, some of the context of a system call. So the file to read, or a directory, or a capability owned by the process. These are all things that can be considered in the context of the call. <clears throat> uh, at the bottom, you'll see nodes that say deny and allow. That's the decision we make in the end. So we're going to go through the graph, and we end up at one of those. Uh, and as you can see by the arrows, that's the only place we can stop. Uh, the solid arrow is if the condition is matched. Dotted means it's not matched. So it's like a con uh, flow graph. Uh, we begin our bad system call AV uh, at A, and so we say, does the condition of context A apply? Is, is A relevant to the system call? And as you can see at the top, this is, uh, this is relevant. A is in bad system call's context. And then we consider C. Uh, is C there? And, and C is not present as one of the context elements. Uh, so we say that's a not match. We're going to follow a dotted line. And now we finally check V, which is present, and that's a match. And so we end up at a deny decision. This is a system call that would be denied. The app doesn't have to crash. It just doesn't get access to whatever it was trying to access. So um, I'm going to show you how we would collapse this graph into a uh, human readable form. Unfortunately, the color is making it a little harder to see, but I'm going to point out that B is the node we care about right now. Um, so we're going to work on this recursively. We'll start from the bottom. You can see that B, if the condition is matched, will deny. If it's not matched, it's going to allow the operation. So what we really want, if we're going for allow, is anything but B. And we go ahead and negate B, because that's really what we mean. Uh, now we've also flipped those edges to match with the semantics of what we're showing. So if it's not B, then we're going to allow the operation. The next uh, uh, combining of nodes is a similar intuition. If you take C, if C is present, then we want to allow the operation. That's a context that we will allow based on. And if it's not there, if it doesn't match, then we're also going to try not B. So you can match either of these if, you're willing to get to, if you want to get to allow. So we'd combine them and then say, I want to match any of not B or C. Uh, next, A is sort of the opposite. We have to match A. Um, if you don't match A, you go straight to deny. And if, even if you do, you must also consider the next uh, phrase. So we would say that you must match all of A and any of not B or C. Um, and as you can see, this is now human readable, but it, it looks nasty. It looks kind of like functional programming, because it is. It's based on scheme. Uh, we need to get this into a, a more computer-friendly format that we can make queries about. So we're on to the next challenge, dealing with complexity. <clears throat> the sandbox profile language is a collection of rules. Each of these rules has four components. Um, we have a decision, allow or deny, uh, what you want to do if the rule is, is found to be the correct match. Um, the next one is the operation. An operation represents the system call that you're making. In this case, it's a file write. It could also be an inbound network connection, any system call. Next, we have filters. These filters deal with the context of the system call. So it would be very crude if I said, this process cannot write files. I want to say exactly which file it can write to. And I do that through a filter. Uh, in this case, we have two filters. We're saying you have the access to the directory address book, that's subpath mode. Uh, we're also saying that you need the address book extension, which is a capability a process can have. So, so processes can have more or less privilege based on these extensions and entitlements. Uh, so those are our two filters. Finally, we have what I'm calling a meta filter. Uh, there's the require all uh, bit here, and that acts as a logical and on the two filters. So meta filters just allow you to combine filters in interesting ways or negate them. You, you can do logical <laughs> operations. So uh, in short, this little sandbox rule means that I can write to the address book directory as long as I have the right sandbox extension. Uh, we want to convert this sandbox profile language into Prolog. So the reason we chose Prolog is that it's been used 
in prior work for policy analysis. I think it's then flashing. Uh, prior work by follows in the analysis, and further, we simplify our prolonged facts by representing them in disjunctive normal form. I mentioned that we have a lot of logical operations, ands and ors. Uh, we can simplify this by combining all the ands and then separating them with ors. Uh, our template for a prolonged fact is the decision, which is allow or deny, the operation, which is the system call we care about, and the list of filters that represent the context of that system call. And so with all of this, we built a SPPL to prolog compiler. Here's an example of what would go into the compiler and what you expect to come out. We have a very nasty looking uh, sandbox with lots of nested meta filters. And I don't know if any of you can understand it, but even for me, it takes a while to really grasp the intuition here. Um, but once we compile it into Prolog, we can separate it into two facts because it's separated by an OR. There's really two ways you can get access to this file. We would say you can read the literal my file if you have extension A. Or the other way to get to the literal my file is if you don't have extension B. That's really what these rules up top mean, but it's much more clear and also easier to query when you get it in Prolog. So once we have this model, we need to know what kind of questions to ask it. It's like um, asking the computer from Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, what is the greatest question? Well, it'll give you an answer, but you need to have the right question first. So uh, <clears throat> one of the few of the things that we were looking for were write access to system files. We knew that would be bad. Uh, read access to files containing private user data, and then finally, combinations of both so that applications could easily communicate without having to go through proper channels. So if two people can read and write the same file, they can talk as much as they want through that file. So we're going to look deeper into that first flaw, the one where we look for writable system files. <clears throat> the query that we would make, um, it will look for a fact that allows a file write on a certain set of filters. Uh, that filter should be a member of what we're calling system paths. These are file paths owned by the system. Uh, and it should also have no intersection with system capabilities. So if I require a system capability to get to that file, then I don't care. That, that, that would actually be a perfectly reasonable rule. I'm looking for things that don't require system capabilities. One of our results for this would be write access to the address book directory. And so you can see it also requires an address book extension but I'll show you how you can get that fairly easily with a third-party app. So now that we know certain files are writable, how do we prove that they're dangerous? What can you really do with this? Um, we built a proof of concept application to try to test this. We ran it on two different devices, an iOS device running 902 and another non-jailbroken device running 931. At the time of our experiments, 931 was the latest version. So <clears throat> this app that confirms attacks We'll take a, a file path as input, and then it will run several functions against that file path. So it'll try to read it, write it, delete it, change permissions, hard link it, anything you can think of to cause, try to cause trouble with a file. Uh, and then it will output its results and say, I, I couldn't read it, but not because I didn't have permission. It's because the file wasn't there. Uh, and this is very insightful for us. So we collected the successful attacks, and we kind of refined them and then told Apple, and I'll be showing you some of those today. Here are the results we got from our queries. Uh, the container profile produced about 2,000 prolog facts. But when we made a query, such as which files are writable, we only had 10 matching facts. So it's a huge triage benefit where we can focus on just the query, the prolog facts that are popping out after we ask our questions. Um, <clears throat> the reason we have so few exploitable read queries is that many of these files just didn't have any interesting data in them. So we couldn't prove that it was dangerous if we could maybe read which device model you had. That, that may not have been important enough. So uh, I want to show you a little timeline of the responsible disclosure, disclosure process for us. We began building SandScout, and we'd find a bug. And then we would run more analysis and look more at our facts, and we'd find another one. And then we would find another one. And then we got very close to paper submission deadline, and there was a huge rush, and we sent a bunch to Apple at the same time. Um, and then, shortly after the paper was submitted, Apple announced bug bounty, uh, up to $25,000 for each sandbox flaw. We didn't make any money. Uh, we get that question a lot. <laughs> but uh, there is an upside to this. Uh, if your pattern of submitting bugs begins to look like that, you can expect a call from Apple. So we have been um, working with them on solutions to these bugs. I think we're building up a good relationship so far, uh, and I'm looking forward to um, continuing fixing bugs. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about each of the attacks that we found, uh, and I'll try to describe them in an intuitive way. If you want more details, I encourage you to look at the paper. Uh, the first one is based on an Apple Maps privacy leak. 
So Apple Maps will store your recently searched um, locations. So this is for functionality where if you want to go to the same place again, it wants to show you a list of the places you've already asked to find. Uh, this could be an exact address, it could be the name of a store, or it could be something you're really embarrassed about. The problem is that one of our query results told us that this, this directory was readable, and in that directory, uh, there happens to be this file with all these previously searched locations. Well, Apple Maps uses the same sandbox profile as all of these guys, so they also get in too. Uh, any app that knows to read there can get in. The next one is iTunes. It's a really similar situation. Uh, the iTunes application needs to be able to access these files for obvious reasons. Uh, one of the files has all the media titles you own. These are things you've uh, either got for free or paid for on iTunes. Your music, movies, games, uh, no, sorry, not games, uh, podcasts, books, etc. <clears throat> you also have a file there for sync devices. iTunes is in charge of backing up your phone, and it'll remember the names of the devices you've backed up to. A lot of times, those devices will be named after you. So in my case, I have a file that says Luke Desitel's iMac. Makes it very obvious who owns the device. Uh, the problem is that we found the query results saying, by the way, this file is readable. Uh, it's readable by any third-party application. So any of these apps, if they're interested in your music taste, or if somebody really uh, just wants to know something embarrassing about you, they can try to look into this data and try to find out more information. It's particularly worrisome that the new name is in there, so that they're able to more easily uh, pair it back to you. Next, we have a directory metadata leak. Uh, these are several directories with relevant metadata. Uh, your audio recordings, every time you make a new audio recording, it's going to create a new file in the directory. That directory will say that it has been modified. Um, anytime you take a photo, a new directory is created to contain the thumbnail of that photo, and that'll have the time that you took the photo. And finally, when you send an SMS draft on, 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 on an iPhone, the way they remember the draft you were working on is by creating a directory named after the phone number you were talking to and storing the draft there. So if you know which phone number you're looking for, like President Obama's phone number or something, uh, you can see if that file exists. Um, now, <clears throat> the query result that led us here says that we have allow access to file read metadata as long as it's a directory. This means that any application uh, running under container can get metadata of a directory. And it, it takes some intuition to know what that really means and what you can infer, but, but we were concerned about the privacy implications of even leaking this metadata. Now, a lot of the media has been running with this. They don't seem to understand what metadata means. I cannot see your photos. I cannot hear your audio recordings. I only know the timing and maybe how many you have. <clears throat> The next one, the, this category is denial of service. So a third party application can sometimes write to system files. This is something, uh, a query result that we got. Uh, we have several files that are writable. In our results, I showed about nine different paths that we had write access to. The problem here is that a third party app can fill up the system file with a bunch of junk data all the way until the, file, the iOS device has no space left. Once you're out of space, you can't really do much with a phone and they don't have that much to start with. Uh, in fact, if you delete this application, the damage is still there. Uninstalling an application is not going to figure out which system apps, it's, which system files it is tampered with. Next, we have another type of denial of service where I block access to a file that the system or other applications need. So these third-party apps, through the container sandbox profile, they can reach the address book database. So, and the contacts application also needs to use the same file. This result says I have full write access to the address book uh, directory. Anything in the address book directory, I have full write access. I can change permissions, delete, move, whatever I want to do. Uh, as long as I have the address book extension, I'll get to that in the next slide. Now, what I can do is delete the address book. And what, what, what we found is that iOS is fairly clever. Contacts will realize something is wrong, and it'll restore your address book pretty quickly. So instead, as soon as we delete it, and before iOS can restore it, we replace it with a directory. Then when iOS tries to restore it, it says there's a directory there. I'm not going to delete a directory. Uh, it really doesn't know what to do. It's probably an unsafe thing to do an RMRF. Um, so that gets to stay. And then when you try to run contacts, you see an empty list. You can't add any, address, uh, any new contacts, so you can't recover manually. And you also, surprisingly, can't back up to iTunes. Because iTunes will say, I don't know, but there's some kind of error. You have no address book, so this is not going to work. All right, so drastically confuses the system by tampering with this file. And if you uninstall the application, again, the damage is still done. We've done damage to system files that doesn't go away when you remove the apps directory. 
The next one is a privacy setting bypass against the contacts. We can't bypass other privacy settings, but for the address book, we can under certain conditions. Now, the way the address book normally works, I kept talking about the address book extension. You get this extension when the user grants you access. And if the user goes into their settings and they take access away, you lose the extension. So you can't get it anymore. However, let's assume we have, ex uh, we have permission for a small amount of time. <clears throat> and then we found this query result that, again, says what I've been referring to. I can write uh, full write access to this directory as long as I've got the extension. So I know I have temporary access. Um, while I have access, I make a hard link. And I put that hard link outside of the address book directory, the directory that's protected. If I put it in the keyboard cache, which happens to be a very convenient, um, basically world-readable, world-writable directory, all the third-party apps can access it freely, um, then I can get in through that one so that when you take my extension away, I have a new path. I can go through the hard link because they have the same inode. It's effectively the same data. Any change to the real address book will be mirrored in my hard link. If I go through my hard link and I delete everything in there, the same thing will happen in the real address book. This also means that any third-party app that knows to look in the keyboard cache can get to your contacts. They don't even need temporary access. Somebody just has to start the process. And finally, if you uninstall the guilty app, the damage is still done. Next, I want to point out uh, CVE 2015-7001. Uh, we had pointed out this attack to Apple, uh, and they had a response. We were able to reverse engineer the response through Sandblaster so we could see exactly what had changed in the sandbox. And the rule is that you allow a hard link to happen as long as it's not to something in the address book directory. So this stopped us for a little while. Um, but then we realized moving a file doesn't change the inode. So what if we move the whole file over to the keyboard cache? Now that new rule doesn't apply. It doesn't say anything about keyboard cache. It's not in the address book anymore. I make my link, and then I put it back. And now we have exactly the same situation. Um, <clears throat> now, in conclusion, we reverse engineered a bunch of iOS sandbox policies. We modeled and queried those policies. And we found flaws that surprisingly applied to iOS, not just iOS, but also watchOS and tvOS. And we are informally working on solutions with Apple. And we're, so far, at least I'm having a really good time doing it. All right, thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? Because we have room for several questions. Uh, Adam Aviv from the Naval Academy. I thought that was awesome. It was a really good talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. So they use a full sandbox for all the apps, so the policies are defined for every single app. Is there any like app-specific uh, policies that get incorporated, or is it just like if they screw up, it screws up for everyone? So there are at least Two answers to your question, and I'll try to cover them both. Uh, there are some demons in some applications that seem to have specific profiles that are tailored to them. Uh, but in general, most system, pro system applications we've seen, and most of the, all of the third-party applications will be running as container sandbox profile. Uh, now, some of these rules that I pointed out that were conditioned on extensions, or there's another capability called an entitlement, that allows the same profile to have some flexibility. So for example, within the container profile, there will be a rule that says, if you have the mobile Safari entitlement, then sure, you, you can now access the mobile Safari directory. Uh, so most of the time, it's supposed to check these conditions and say, you seem to have the right capabilities, so I'm going to give you more privileges. Uh, sometimes accidents can happen, though. As I said, it's a very, very complicated profile. Somebody could forget to add one of these conditions, or someone could not realize that the third-party app can access the same thing as the system app and then put something private in that file. Thanks. I, I can ask another one. Uh, okay. Question yeah, I'm curious, uh, for the app developers, do you see a way to incorporate into the Sartre so that they're informed early that they may be trying to drive a policy or uh, so I, I'm not as concerned about someone accidentally violating these policies. Uh, it is possible. So if a, third, if a developer somehow realizes he can do these things and he thinks that it's OK to do so, uh, I, don't, I think Apple has some submission guidelines for what is and is not OK. Uh, and probably direct access to some of these files would get you rejected very quickly during the review process. 
uh, I would assume that they would catch you in the review process and tell you that, hey, there's an issue, you need to change this functionality so that you do follow our guidelines. The reason that we're concerned about these flaws is that malicious developers who are actively trying to exploit these will hide that behavior. Uh, but they, they end up knowing exactly what they intended to do. It's just that they hide these actions until you're installed on the device. Uh, but if you're running normally, and Apple is able to see all of the functionality that you expect to run, I'm, I'm sure that they would find that. Uh, now, with regard to an Apple developer asking me, I'd like to know what the policy is, uh, it, it's kind of dangerous, because if we show you everything that you're allowed to do, that may not be everything Apple wants you to do. So I, I don't know, only Apple can say what they think is safe and not safe, and that, that'll come down to the review process. Elaborate a little bit on the uh, performance of your detection system, like how long does it take to run your system to identify the vulnerabilities, and uh, how about the coverage? What is there like any false negatives you consider like missed by your system? Uh, so in our paper, we referenced something that we called a false negative, and we only had two. Uh, and what those were is we ran some of our tests on a jailbroken device, and we found that in, in at least two cases. Uh, we were able to read or write or do some operation that the sandbox profile said should have been denied. And we suspect that that's because of changes made during the jailbreak, or it could be a flaw in our reverse engineering uh, steps. So we, we don't make, unfortunately, we can't make guarantees about correctness of our reverse engineered profiles. Uh, we know that it is syntactically correct because we could compile it, so it's written in correct uh, SPPL. But every rule itself, uh, most of the ones we found were very helpful in guiding. Um, as far as the performance, um, there's a one-time cost of converting all of this from SPPL into Prolog. Um, if I recall correctly, it was either a few seconds or a few minutes. It wasn't something really scary. Uh, and then when you query these Prolog uh, uh, facts, that was actually quite fast, usually just a few seconds. Okay. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.